So to moderate the next panel, um, I'm happy to introduce Tulsi Doshi. She's the product manager of Google's machine learning fairness efforts, where she uh, leads efforts across Google to develop best practices and resources uh, to build more inclusive and diverse products. So please, round of applause to Dulce Dolce and the panel, panelists, everyone. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much again for being here today. Um, we're really excited to be your first panel of what will hopefully be a number of really, really exciting conversations. Um, really excited to be here with all of you. As was mentioned, I lead product for Google's ML fairness efforts and for our responsible research efforts, uh, which means I work with a number of teams and products across Google to think about um, fairness, transparency, privacy in our products, uh, and how do we make sure that we're both learning the cutting edge of how machine learning might uh, both improve and detract from these experiences, and how do we actually make sure that our products are giving the best experiences for all of our users. Um, and so because of that, I'm actually really excited to sit here with these three awesome change makers who are also thinking about responsible AI in the products and the features that they're developing for their users. Um, and so what we'll try and do today is talk a little bit about concerns of privacy, trust, um, fairness, in our products and in the experiences that they're building and hopefully start a conversation that we can continue on through the rest of the day and through more experiences with all of us together. Um, so with that, I will kick it off to these awesome panelists. And what I would love to do is if each of you could introduce yourself, um, introduce the product that you're working on and how you use AI in that product. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hee Jae Lim, and I'm the founder and CEO of Talking Points. Now, Talking Points, our mission is to unlock the potential of families and parents in supporting their children's education. If you think about a parent as a child's first teacher, children spend 70% of their time outside school. Um, and there's a ton of research to show that parent engagement matters so much in predicting a student's success. But if you are a parent who doesn't speak English, who's new to the country, you're not educated yourself, then that's really hard to do. So we've built a multilingual family engagement platform that lets teachers and parents communicate with one another with two-way translation, with personalized guidance on what they can do to support their children. Uh, we're reaching about a million families in 2020. And the way that we use AI is twofold. One is to be able to improve our translation quality by augmenting machine translation with human crowdsource translation data that is more education domain specific. And second, to be able to give personalized coaching and recommended content to parents and teachers, depending on who they are and depending on who the students are as well. Hi, my name is Clara Norden and I'm a girl working with the famous Nada Malou. <laughs> Um, I'm the director of the MSF Foundation, which is an entity dedicated to uh, foster uh, innovation uh, within uh, Doctor Without Borders. And um, the project has been uh, quite well explained by Jacqueline. She did a job for me. So. But it's about uh, tackling antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is about uh, to cause the death of 10 million uh, persons per year by 2050. So. To give you an order of magnitude, it's the death toll of uh, cancer today. And uh, the app guides a laboratory technician, a non-expert laboratory technician, to go through the interpretation of a test that he gives to a clinician so that he can uh, adjust uh, the treatment for the, for the patient. And we use AI uh, with uh, image processing to speed up the reading process and uh, help uh, the clinician and the laboratory technician to identify a specific shape on the Petri dish. Um, hi, my name is Nancy, and I am part of the Crisis Text Line team. And we are 24-7 support at your fingertips, so in your pocket. And our goal is to make it easier to get help than avoid getting help. Um, and our project has been about making sure that that help is as fast and as accurate as possible 
So we're a human first company. We believe that if you're in a moment of crisis and you can't cope, you deserve an empathetic human on the other side. But we also believe that AI makes humans better. That I could do long division, but I'm much faster and more accurate on a calculator. And, uh, and the same is with our supervisors and our crisis counselors, um, that if we can triage the queue, if we can take the most imminent cases first, like a hospital emergency room takes the gunshot wound or the person having a heart attack before the kid with a sprained ankle, that we should do the same thing as a hotline. And so we're grateful because every second shaved off is probably another life saved. Thank you. I mean, first of all, I just have to say it's amazing to be sitting here with all three of you. I think the work that your organizations are doing is, is so amazing and, and directly impacting quality of life, right? And Nancy, I really liked your point of just, you know, we believe that AI can make humans better. And I think that's a really strong tenant of responsible AI, right? How do we really think about how humans and AI work together? And so I guess what I'd love to ask each of you is, is how do you think about what does responsible AI really mean to you in the context of your organizations? Are there particular aspects of like privacy, explainability, or fairness that stand out to you as being particularly important, um, and why? And maybe you can just do a you know quick you know here's what what we think about when we say responsible AI. Yeah, maybe we can start actually on okay. Nancy on the other side and then go this way. Um, so I'm going to say something uh, ironically, something predictable, and then I'm going to say something <laughs> not predictable. So let's do it that way. So something predictable is you obviously want it to be representative of real people. So um, thankfully, our corpus, our corpus does tend to skew, but it skews young, poor, rural, and diverse. Like 44% of the people texting us are LGBTQ. We do tend to skew young. Um, we do tend to skew female. And so some of, we also tend to skew Hispanic. So some of this does need to be balanced out because we want to make sure that algorithms are representative. And so thankfully, Jackie, wave Jackie, spends a lot of her time doing that. Oh, there's, there's another Jackie, Jacqueline Fuller. Doesn't yet work for us, but we can work on that, Jacqueline. Um, so that's the predictable thing that I'm going to say that I think everybody here cares that their algorithms, it's, it'll happen, girl. Um, and so everybody, everybody here cares about stuff being representative. But I'm going to say something now not predictable and maybe a little bit surprising. Ooh, OK. Um, which is. I think people think that social change organizations should go slow and carefully, and that the whole mantra out here of like move faster and break things shouldn't be applied to our organizations because the work that we do is so precious. And so what I'm going to say to that is that we should actually move fastest, that these are the world's biggest problems. These are the world's biggest problems. We deserve the best technology and the best people. So we are hiring. Just going to put that out there. Because <laughs> we said backstage, we're both hiring, so it was a race to get it in first. So, um, so that's what I would say about responsible AI is like, work with us. What's been so great about this project is the mentorship that our team has had and how we've been able to grow and try new things, because this is life-saving it's not trying to get like Chinese food at 2 a.m. or a car in the rain. You know, like this is the really important stuff. And so we need the best possible algorithms and the best possible work. So you can call me. <laughs> Fair. Wait for it. Fair, you want to follow that, that lead? <laughs> She's hiring too. <laughs> CTO. Uh, Ooh, so, but me too. Uh, oh, let's confuse. You're all right. All right. <laughs> so, um, for us as a medical organization, uh, we had to set uh, the highest standard possible, and some of those standards already exist because actually we discover, not discovered, but we are uh, qualifying for uh, in vitro medical device. So we are under stringent uh, European regu regulation mm -hmm. about privacy, patient mm -hmm. consent, how you manage your data, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the other part doesn't exist quite yet. It's about uh, how you evaluate the performances. And uh, if the world is to capitalize on the, on the potential of this technology, we have to, uh, to have more of this open discussion like today about uh, sharing failures as well, sharing limits of algorithm, uh, but also um, to, uh, to, uh, to build up those, uh, those framework uh, we have uh, the help of the, a focus group, the fo a focus group AI for Health. So it's uh, two UN agencies, WHO and uh, ITU, 
with the help of the uh, German uh, the research society uh, called the Fraunhofer Society. And they uh, help us uh, just sharing experience and protocol about how we sort of evaluating the performances of uh, our uh, AI diagnostic tool. And then submitting to peer review, engage discussion, and hopefully by the end of the year, it will translate into a recommendation by the WHO. So it's a healthier way we could think of uh, toward a responsible AI, but it's still a work in progress. So it's quite a very interesting time. Um, for us, similar to Crisis Text Line, about 80% of our schools are from underserved communities, um, very heavily skewed towards you know, low-income communities. Many of our parents um, don't speak English. Many of them can be undocumented. Um, and they are discussing somewhat traumatic experiences on our platform. We actually saw a spike in the last election uh, the week after. So it's real that gets discussed on the platform. Um, they're often also concerning students and children who are minors. So privacy becomes really important to us. Um, and secondly, I think you mentioned fairness to see. So um, one of our goals is to change behaviors and not necessarily reinforce subconscious biases that we already see in the data. Um, and what that means is you know, building algorithms and recommendations that necessarily don't reinforce the current behaviors that we already know are biased. Um, so what's our responsibility as an organization in product development, but also as an organization who is a thought leader in the family engagement space to really push that thinking forward? Um, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> and I think one thing that we know is that we cannot necessarily do it alone. And that's why we bring groups together like this, which is awesome. Um, so I guess, you know, uh, both Nancy and Hija, you touched on this idea of representation and skews in, in the population that uses your product. And I know even with MSF, there's questions of where do we get the data from? Where do we have data access? Um, how do you think about, you know, as you're trying to build a product fast and as you're trying to really get something out the door to help these communities, how do you think about representation um, and what are ways that you think about, you know, data collection, balance, diversity, fairness? And Clara, maybe I'll start with you. How do you think about, about that kind of, uh, the, the risk of bias? Um, so about the, the, the main challenge we have, it's a general challenge when working uh, in uh, innovation for, the, uh, for uh, MSF is that being on the field myself before, you don't want to be bugged to try some stuff <laughs> on top of your routine. So uh, now at the foundation, we try to really make sure we, on, we are working onto something that uh, might really work and be helpful to the field quite quickly. So that's why the first data set, we took it from a neighboring uh, teaching hospital in France, just to make the proof of concept. But then quite early on the process, we realized if we want uh, the product and the ML model to work on the laboratory where we work, we need to have access to those data. So we invest into proactive uh, uh, data collection and uh, to be sure that it can capture all the specificities of the field, like resistance pattern or uh, uh, prevalences or the type of phone that they are using that are quite different. So it's something quite, uh, quite uh, sensitive. And uh, we realize that there's a lot of differences, but uh, we only on uh, uh, Aman, so we are looking for uh, opening more uh, uh, data collection in other, uh, in other contexts so we, are, we can capture other diversity. Yeah, I think there's a really good point there too about just even proof of concept being so different from what's on the field, right? And how do we make sure that we think about every environment differently yeah. as, we're, as we're building machine learning systems? I don't know, Nancy or Hijay, if you have other, other thoughts you want to add there. Um, we see, so there's research in parent-teacher communication and parent engagement that actually shows that um, teachers are subconsciously biased. And how that shows up in communication patterns is if you're a white middle-class parent, you're much more likely to get more communication around positive things that's happening in this school. Um, and teachers are much more likely to communicate negative incidences or behaviors um, to black and brown students. So you think, if you think about, okay, how does that show up in our data collection, question mark, and if we used AI to reinforce 
the current behaviors, you can imagine what kind of behaviors we will be encouraging unintentionally. So as we're thinking about data collection or reinforcing behaviors, you know, if we are building a standard tech product to help users do things faster and easier and more convenient to be able to improve the engagement metrics, those would be the goals. But our goals are not that. Our goals are to be able to reinforce the behaviors that make a difference based on research and encourage our users to behave in certain ways differently, again, based on research. So, I think thinking about data collection, thinking about how do you build models that both reinforce but also not reinforce um, the bias that users might have without them knowing about this themselves is something that we continuously think about. And honesty, I think, is a challenging task. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think um, you know, one point that was brought up was the importance of privacy. Um, you talked about you know, different groups of individuals having different communication patterns, potentially. Nancy, you highlighted you know, different skews in your population. How do you think about privacy, especially with this kind of sensitive information, education, healthcare, you know, mental health? Um, maybe you want to take a stab at, at so privacy. 68% of the people who text us um, tell us something they've never shared with another human being. So they're coming out for the first time. They're sharing that they're hearing voices for the first time, that they um, you know, that they suffer panic attacks or that they have suicidal ideation. 28% of them say they're having suicidal ideation. And um, so, yeah, it's, and if you think about that corpus, it's about 150 million messages now, um, entirely sentiment, all unstructured, right? It's not a survey, it's not a branch survey, it's not a script. Um, and it's also labeled by humans on both sides. So almost 100% of our crisis counselors fill out a survey at the end, and 19% of our texters fill out a survey at the end. And we've had an outside study to show that we've got imputation. It's, it's representative. Um, so um, that's juicy. Uh, and we can do some really exciting things with that. And where active rescues are concerned, where we have to actually trigger an active rescue, so um, imminent risk situations, we actually have a baseline, because we know when people like Sam Nadler, who's here, one of our supervisors, has to call 911 which we do now about 32 times a day. Um, we are in the position where we need to call 911 because someone has the ideation, the plan, the means, and the timing to hurt themselves or frankly someone else. Um, and we need to call in for help. Um, here, here's what's great about the privacy and protection um, of those users. <clears throat> it's the only thing I care about. Um, I, I'm, I don't care about like a stock price or pleasing like Unilever in an ad <laughs> algorithm, or, um, or like a VC who's all over me. Um, not physically, you know what I mean. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, like I, I am, I am, I am, we are laser focused on helping people. All of these organizations, all 20 of these organizations are laser focused on that one thing. And when you're laser focused on that one thing and a little evangelical about it, if I'm, if I'm really honest, um, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to prize privacy. So one of the first things that we did was build a, an auto PII scrubber. And um, it automatically scrubs about 96% of the PII. In fact, it's been really challenging lately because we know that music is a top form of self-care. And we really wanted to find out like which music, like BTS, Ariana Grande, but Ariana Grande gets automatically scrubbed and so does BTS because they're names. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a bummer. Right. Um, but um, so I'm, we're laser focused on the user. In fact, I will say to the extent I just pointed out Sam Nadler, the way we started this work and on our team that's been part of this work, and thank you Google for letting us have her be part of this work, is one of our supervisors <laughs> who's a trained social worker who lives in Tennessee and she has been part of every one of these forums and treated with respect, frankly, by the mentors and by the other teams. And um, it, it keeps our product strong because um, you represent the user. And for us to keep the user in the middle of this work um, is really important to us. And um, we will never sacrifice that. But we don't have to. Yeah. No one's going to clap, really? <laughs> I think you touched on some really important aspects there, just like putting the user first, right? And of course, the importance of thinking about PII, thinking about as you're building your algorithm, what information is it learning from? What information can it learn from? And what information it shouldn't learn from? Um, Clara and Hijay, other thoughts on privacy? I think, I mean, plus one on what Nancy was saying. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Crisis Text Line, MSF, and Talking Points are all nonprofits. And part of that, for us at least, for our educators and families, our incentives are aligned, our mission is aligned. Um, we will not use the data for commercial purposes. And I think that's a really clear statement and stake in the ground and branding that continues to reinforce um, our kind of mutual commitment to privacy and um, use of data to really kind of further on the mission as opposed to there's like a side hustle. <laughs> Wait, actually, let me comment on that because the data exhaust is another story. And, and we should not... If I wanted to be a wedding planner, I would have been a wedding planner. It makes me nuts when not-for-profits have to throw dinners just so they can pay people. Um, we, we, that business model is fakakta. Like we just, it's, there's no business model really for not-for-profits. And so a few years ago, we had a couple of companies come to us and say, gosh, you know a lot about moving people from hot to cool just with language. Like you can't coupon them, refund them. You're essentially doing customer service. And if you think about it, everybody texting crisis text line is miserable. It's basically customer service, and we have to move them. You've learned a lot. Can you teach us? And I was like, we're not getting donors paying us and training volunteers that we can help a Fortune 100 company do better with customer service, but would you pay us for that? And they said yes. And so we spun out a new company. Um, we raised a seed round led by Floodgate. Um, uh, in a couple of weeks, there'll be another announcement about some stuff. Um, but Lyft and Intuit are our first customers. Um, there's no, they have no access to PII, but they have access to general trends to compare with Lyft's corpus of customer service data. And I'll just put it out there that I gave all the founders equity to Crisis Text Line. And so now Crisis Text Line um, owned 53% of this venture-backed company that's leveraging what we've learned in the data to basically put more empathy in the world and help more people. So it's called loris.ai, and I hope it becomes a unicorn so that I never have to raise money. <laughs> I don't think we have time to talk as much about you know, putting the user first and user trust and privacy, but I know Di and the panel that's coming up later will talk a little bit about that user experience flow. So we'll let you talk to some of the other organizations about that. Um, what I would love to end on before we sort of leave is, um, you know, we're here with an amazing group of individuals. We're all learning together about how to think about responsible AI. Um, what asks or needs do you have from this group, or what would you like, <laughs> other than hiring, Clara and Nancy are hiring. <laughs> um, but, but if you, you know, if you, or, or you know, what last thoughts would you like to share with this group before we, before we wrap up? Wow, what a shock. We're hiring too, <laughs> <laughs> just so everyone knows. Um, I think a couple of things. I mean, we also um, tap it with the way that we collect data for our translation work is through volunteers, a lot of volunteer community translators. So if you're bilingual, you can plug onto our platform, you can translate for us. Of course, the PIIs are scrubbed so that you won't see any sensitive data. Um, we have about 20 million messages um, now that are being trained, so you could volunteer for us. Um, I think everyone knows an educator or a parent or a school administrator. Um, Talking Points is free for teachers, so please spread the word. Um, and lastly, I think kind of join join talking points and like help us create this movement. I do think there is a bias where um, because we're a nonprofit, we don't move as fast and we don't use cutting, te cutting edge technology. In fact, I think we move faster and we do push the boundaries because we are so committed to our mission and serving our families to improve student outcomes. So I think just changing your mindset and reframing that a little bit um, is going to go a long way. I think uh, uh, AI is so, it, it's technical and, uh, and uh, many of uh, domain in health are very technical and we as MSF, we don't intend to become a big software company. So I think it's really uh, uh, one of the projects where we can think of uh, 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 the, the power of collaboration. And I think of uh, the foundation uh, uh, being able to become a kind of a catalyst for may maybe other projects like that and uh, ultimately uh, manage to uh, gather and share uh, patient uh, uh, and underrepresented uh, population because for now it's more focused on the, the northern country. So I think there's a, a way to go there. Um, ben and Maggie are also here from our team and they left 
um, Amazon, each of them actually, to come work with us. And I see other people in the room who have been doing this social good work for a long time. I see you, Jim Fruchterman. I see you, Beth Cantor. And uh, so what I want to say to everybody here is you are all Jedi. And your lightsaber could be red or blue. <laughs> and what I'm saying to you is make the choice to wield your expertise blue. I'm, I'm not being funny. I'm, we're all hiring. And um, y'all look good. <laughs> <laughs> and on that very positive note, um, <laughs> we will wrap up today's panel, or at least this one of it. Um, thank you all, and, and thank you, all three of you, for sharing your thoughts. I think. We're still learning so much about fairness, about building trust with our users, about privacy. And I think these organizations are at the cutting edge with all of us. And so um, please share your thoughts and your learnings as you learn about more about how we think about these issues in your own products. And you know, find me after, find, uh, find these folks after, and we'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.